Yes, yes, yes. So here, here, here. Shalom, shalom, chabarim, shalom. Let's clear this right here. So here, let's let's address a flat nose and give thanks to one of I and I chabers, Wendeme. Yes, Ra Sasha Lapasha, for asking that question about the flat nose. That's how I would come forward to it. And we were going through, I think, a psalm. Psalm 74 is a psalm. It comes from Ha Torah, where it says the, the, the idea when it speaks about Erek Apayim, Erek Apayim. In the Hebrew, that's one of the 13 attributes of Yahweh, of Hashem, of Jav, Jehovah. These 13 attributes that are revealed to Moshe, to Moshe within, um, I think uh, it is uh, Shemot, yes, yes, in Shemot. And Moses, Moshe has called to use these particular attributes, especially when he plea bargains for the Bnei Yisrael after the, um, the molten calf that's falsely called the golden calf. But here, let us address right here the flat nose, the flat nose um, controversy, controversy. Right. So first, let's bring up the verse right here in the scripts. Right. We're going to speak about the flat nose and what does the flat nose really mean? Flat nose in the Bible. Right. So first of all, let's find the script right here, here, here. Let's just do this right here and just open it up like this. Continuing on from the previous video. So here one can see kind of the order of the subject matters that we're going through. So the flat earth now. There's ones and ones that speak about that speak about the flat um, the flat earth here yeah, the flat earth flat nose <laughs> well the earth is it's not flat flat it's not flat flat but the true thing we can say concerning the earth is that the earth is not a planet a planet is a wandering star I know ones have been made to believe that we also have been made to be naive that but the more we study it. With the real true shape of the earth, besides what we have revealed in the Bible, even NASA can't says or uh, has not come to really reveal, not by their photographic evidence at least. Their photographic evidence a lot of is CGIF. So not addressing the flat earth, but speaking about in the scripture, we have the flat nose. But what we say for the record, as we said even before, is that the earth is not flat, flat, that the earth is a plane. We, we're on an earthly plane. Right, and there's planes in different, you, you could say, in different um, conceptions, so to speak. There's the plane, like this is the plane, you know, the earthly plane. There's planes of reality, planes of consciousness, so forth and so on, but not a planet, right? And it's the, the celestial is the globe. The globe is the celestial. Now, I know I'm speaking on, you know, the flat earth a little bit, but the earth is not flat, flat. So we're not down to flat, flat ones on that level, but definitely the horizon is a very important proof point. But here to this particular point concerning flat nose, and he was asked to, you know, address this particular subject matter. We have addressed it before, but let's address it here again. This is a very important subject matter. It's one of those subject matters we had come across in some wasp white Anglo-Saxon Protestant like Christianities or kind of Bible talk, you know, Bible, Bible kind of talk. Ones mention this and they say, oh, woo, woo, woo. the Bible here is racist because it says flat nose. So here's the verse in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 18. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose, or anything, 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 superfluous. So this is the verse right here. You can see when we look it up, it's only one time in the KJV, right? Only one time we have it here, here, here in the King James, right? In the King James version right here. So we have, for whatsoever man he be, that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose. Anything superfluous, anything superfluous, which is saying anything extra. So let's first of all get a good context of this particular verse. Right? Let's put this into to context. First of all, we're in the third book of Moshe right here. This is the Hebrew book known as Leviticus, this particular book 
call the Sefer Vayikra, 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 right? And he called, Vayikra, Vayikra, and he called based on the first words in this third scroll. So in the book of Leviticus, it is the handbook, the handbook of the priests, of the Kohani. So what we have here is the handbook of the priests, the Kohani. It was Hashem, and we say Hashem defer to Yahweh, hey, Yahweh, to Jehovah, speaking to and of him as the name, Hakadosh Baruch Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be he, blessed be the name. Right? His intent that is revealed in Exodus, the second book of Moshe, Robeno, he says that Israel, Yisrael, is to be a a a kingdom of the priests. Right, of the priesthood and a holy, a set apart, a set apart nation, right? But then after the molten calf, falsely called the golden calf, there's no really golden calf in the Bible. It's a molten calf. It had some gold, yeah, but the proper name for it, according to the scripts, right, is the molten calf. See, there's a lot of things that, see, if you believe those little make-believes and it's not even there in the scripts, Right? Then other things they can superimpose on top of it. So what we're doing is like clearing out some of the, you know, so-called weeds, the bad weeds that have been growing up. You know what I'm saying? Around our understanding of the scripture. So first of all, before we even get into the flat nose part, let's put the book of Leviticus into context. Right? And what is being spoken of here into context. Because reading the verse just isolatedly, right, can give ones a a a miscontext or a misinterpret. Counterfeit Christianity has already done that, and so here, 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 this is you know this is like the salvation, Jah salvation army work right here, 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 right. So Leviticus is the handbook of the priests. Israel, all the firstborn males of Yisrael, as was the ancient custom and practice, would be the priests of the the tribe of the family the mispaka right of the bite of the house of that particular family but after the molten calf incident right the molten calf incident in the wilderness they had broke the covenant they had just entered into the brit that they just entered into they had broke it so even in the old testament we have the principle of renewing Right, the renewing, like the Chadash, Chadasha, the renewing of the covenant. We have this in the wilderness scene. So, after that, we go, come to the third book, and here is where Levite, right, the, the tribe of Levite, it has now the sacerdotal or the priestly function exclusively to itself because of how they stood or resisted, you know, the temptation to worship the idols, the idolatry, the molten calf the Kemetisisms and the isms that some of the Israelites were still, you know, they were still on that. So we get here the book that is speaking to the priestly service, the Aboda, the Aboda or the Avoda, some would say, the Aboda, the priestly service. So here it is speaking concerning the children of Israel and within the children of Israel, the tribe of Levi that would hold the priesthood functions. Aaron and his sons would be the anointed ones, the Moshiach, right, and the Meshachawian, like the Moshachim, the Messiah, you could say the first Christian, the first anointed was Aaron. That's why Aaron becomes that type in the New Testament and his sons. Now, all the other Israelites would be rank and file, just regular Israelites. So among the children of Israel, we can look at a, a trifold kind of a division, right, of the children of Israel. Right? We have the Kohanim, the priests. Then we have the Luim, the Levites, the servants and assistants, the adjuncts to the priests, right? to the children of Aaron, Aaron and sons. And then we will have the, the, the Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel, the Bait Yisrael, all other Israel, then, then the rank and file, the regular men. So what, what happened effectively in the wilderness scene was that this ancient custom of the firstborn males being the priests of the family would cease and had ceased, right? Because of their, because of their breaking their word. They had broke their word in the wilderness. Covenant was broken and then it was renewed when Moshe went back up, right? He had to carve two tablets of stone, another 40 days, and he besieged and all of that right there. Now, as we point to this point about the flat nose right here, 
right, we're going to have to also look at Exodus. So in order to understand the third book, we need to be better grounded and get a good groundation in the second book so we can see the context. So when it says, for whatsoever man he be, whatsoever man, whatsoever ish, he be. Now let's go here, let's go into this chapter right here, that's verse 18, right? Look what it says right here. This gives the context, the first verse where it says, And Yahweh, hey, Yahweh, Jehovah said to Moshe, to Moses, speak to the priest, ha Kohanim, the Kohanim, the priest, right? The Benay, right? Benab, right? Benayo, you know, the sons of Aharon, of Aaron, and say to them, so who is being spoken to? Right? Jehovah said to Moshe, so Jehovah now is communicating to Moses, and Moses is being told to speak to Ha Kohanim. Remember, the priests are the sons, are Aaron and sons. Aaron and sons. Now, remember that all of the Kohanim, the priesthood, were Levites, but not all the Levites were priests. Right? Just like we can say that that all the 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 priests were Israelites but not all Israelites were priests that all the Levites were B'nai Yisrael sons of Israel right? but not all the Israelites were Levites right? so here this is being spoken by Jehovah to Moses to speak to HaKohanim and here is speaking not even to just all the Levites but is speaking specifically to Aharon, to Aaron, and to sons. It says even so, speak to HaKohanim, the priests, the sons of Aharon, specify who these priests are. All right? So everything that we get in this chapter, chapter 21, is exclusively speaking to the Kohanim, right? the priests, the sons, right? the sons of Aharon, the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron. So all this instruction we're getting here, this is Ha Torah, this is Torah, the Torah direction instructions, is being given to Ha Kohanim, right? To the priests, right? To the priesthood, right? This is specific. So this instruction was not given to all the Levites, though the Levites were no doubt aware of this, right? It was not given to all the Israelites, although the Israelites were aware of this. This is specifically being given right, to those who are anointed. And, and I want to emphasize that there, those who are mashacha, mashach, mashach, mashacha, those who are anointed, right? The Moshiach, Moshiach, in this sense, Kohen Gadol, Aharon, and his sons. Right? It even says so in this particular verse here, verse 10 of chapter 21. So we're scrolling through this chapter. So all this instruction here was not just speaking to all the Israelites. This was not direct instruction to all the Israelites, but is speaking specifically to Ha Kohani. It's like we draw three concentric circles. It's speaking to the inner circle, to the priesthood. Could the priesthood have that intercessory role, right, between Ha Elohim, Ha Elohim, the power, the Almighty, the source? And between the Bnei Yisrael, the sons and children of Israel, between we could say in principle between Ha'ilahim, the power and man and humanity, right? This is why when we come to the 18th verse, it says, "For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous." Now. This whole flat nose thing right here has been greatly taken out of proportion based on counterfeit Christianity or white Anglo-Saxon wasp, wasp Christianity. It looks like a bee, but it doesn't produce honey, right? Wasp Christianity. And with just another place, another area from the Bible based on counterfeit whitewashed Christianity where the white man or those white men lied, right? Where they lied in Jesus' name. Right? They say, oh, this is a black man. Right? I know the Mormons got some kooky beliefs around this. And no doubt others. They might have changed some of that. I know the Mormons have changed certain things, you know, to be more inclusive and all of that. 
right? But what does this really mean? He that have a flat nose. Now, it's the H2763 word. Let's look at this word. We have haram, haram. We have haram. What is haram? Haram, first we go, we go to the BDB, means to ban, to devote, to destroy utterly, completely destroy. Dedicate for destruction, exterminate. Remember, we're looking at the word for flat nose, haram, haram, right? Pro prohibit, ban, right? Consecrated, devoted, dedicated, but the sense is something that is set apart to be destroyed, right? To be exterminated. So here we get the different senses of the verb, right? As we have, we have haram, right there, haram, right? And right here, we got the strongs here now of haram. This is the word for flat nose, a primitive root to seclude. Now, learning how to read the Strong's definition, those words that I italicize brings out the, the core idea as best as the you know, translators, lexicon and graphers, like Jesenius and so forth and so on, you know, have brought it forward specifically by a ban to devote. So it means to devote, to set aside, to seclude, Right? But in different contexts, one context to devote for religious usage, especially destruction, physically and reflexively to be blunt as to the nose. Right? To be blunt. Make a curse, consecrate, utterly destroy. You can see right here, it says have a flat nose, utterly. So the last, def the last entries are really bringing out how it is used in different areas, how it's been translated. Right? Or anything superfluous. Right? We have sara, sara, right? The sara extended. Anything that's extended, prolonged, or deformed, like excessive. Anything that's over. Right? Kind of goes along with the idea in the Hebrew of tamin. Right? That can, it has been translated as perfect, like, like Noah, Noah was perfect in his generations. And then with, with, with Yaakov, Jacob, it says that he was a plain man, tam. He used it more in the singular sense, Tom, Tom, right? He was complete. Like the offerings must be Tommy. That means if like an animal has one head and, and four legs, so forth and so on, and a little tail or whatever else like that, two ears, two eyes, is not to have three ears, you know, or, or, th or, or three legs or something like that. It's to be the way that Hashem created it, right? Habore created it from the very beginning, right? So here, let's now touch on the verse. Let's go more into the verse and compare this verse right here. So we can get to the Hebrew, get to more of the root. So here, let's go down to Tanakh right here. Let's go to this one right here, where it says, Ki, call Ish, Asher, Bo, Mum, Lo, Yikrav, Ish, Iwer, Iwer, or some would say modern Hebrew, Iver, Iver, or Iwer, Iwer, blind, or, or, Fiseach, 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 or, Harum, Harum, right, the Harum, right, or, Sarua, Sarua, Sarua. So the word here is the Harum, right, as we brought that out already, the Harum. Once again, the Harum. So here is pointing as Harum. Now looking at the senses, right? The Harum, right? The Harum. The Harum sense right here, right? The Harum sense, right? So they bring out this as flat, right? It's like the Pu'al sense, right? Something happened with his nose physically. Are we to interpret this phys physically? Let's look at KJV right here. Look at the KJV. It says, a blind man, right? How many ways can a person be blind? We talk about Isaac, right? Yitzhak, he was legally blind that chapter where he wanted to give his psychic, his soul blessing to Aesop because he loved his venison. He loved the, the hunt, you know, that Aesop, right? His, you could say, the eldest according to the natural order of birth. So we know blindness, right? One can be spiritually blind. Man is a trifold being. Man is a trifold, a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. One can be physically blind, 
right? But one can be spiritually, psychologically blind, right? It says a man, right? A blind man or a lame, right? Peseach. Now, Peseach, Peseach and Pesach, Pesach, as we say, like Fasica, is interesting because it means to limp. One who's lame, one who limps, right? From Pasach, like Pasach. Remember, pass over, spring over, right? In the secondary sense, is to be limp, right? To be to be lame, right? To be lame in that sense, right? To be lame, right? One who's lame, like even as we say today, one one's lame, right? One can be lame, right? We use that expression not just in the physical sense, right? But in a metaphorical sense, and don't think that people before who spoke, who thought, who were every much human beings as we be human beings, did not speak the same way. This is where you get the real keys. Or he that hath a flat nose, right? Now the flat nose, are we speaking physically of a flat nose? So what was a flat nose, right? What's a flat nose? Some have maintained through racist Christianity, counterfeit Christianity, whitewash Christianity, wasp, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestantism, right? And Vaticanianism, that a flat nose is like a black person. This is a, 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 a straight when I say straight, but it's strictly a, a stereotype, a racist stereotype. We know that all black people, right, so-called, right, we don't all have the same, you know, um, gradation of melanation, right, in our skin complexion. We have all kinds of phenotypes, right? Sometimes among certain groups or tribes or ethnicities, they may share certain phenotypes, because usually the people they marry into this kind of community of people, and so there'll be a lot of similarities. But black people generally don't only have one so-called phenotype, but in a lot of stereotypical racist media, especially here in these 400 years in the Americas and the Caribbean, the, the, the Gentiles, the Anglo-Americans, Anglo-European, the Gentiles over here, they have used that particular stereotype. So many ones, when they read this, they think, oh, I'm black, and therefore I must have a flat nose, right? Now, if we now just go into, this is one perspective, right? This is one perspective of it right here, just on the flat nose. So now let's bring up some of, some of, um, okay. Now, let's look at this whole thing that goes on in archaeology. Now, some allege that it was the archaeologists, when they found these things, they shot off the noses off of the sphinx, so they shot off the noses and they, and they threw down statues or they broke off the noses, right? That this was done, you know, by Napoleon or uh, the British who came in after Napoleon, so forth and so on. Now, this is not to say that that was not done in any case, right? But to say that all of the examples that we have of this is because of that is erroneous is false even in the ancient days if we study ancient culture ancient egypt different ancient cultures people had a different understanding of the physical parts and how these physical parts related psycho spiritually so when we talk about metaphysics and esoterics today some people think it's like a new thing that we're talking nowadays that the ancient peoples Right? The peoples of the scripture, the people of the book, also saw and perceived the reality on these levels, these layers, these levels, you know, um, we could say in these dimensions, right, or these planes of reality. They were able to perceive it. And we note this because of their writings. Much that we can see in their writings is very clear, even in the usage of words. So flat nose is one of those. This is say somebody's blind. Well, he's a blind man. You don't see this spiritual, psycho spiritual reality. You're lame. You can't really walk it out. You can't walk this out. You can't walk out this. You can't live out this reality. Remember that even in Leviticus chapter 21, it's speaking specifically to Aaron and sons, the sons of Aharon, who were to be Ha Kohani, who was to be the, the, the priesthood, right? You know, the priests. So we have. This right here, I thought this was interesting from live science, 
they go into this right here and it says let me just read a portion of this it says that the ancient Egyptians were artistic champions carving countless stat statues that showcase the society's pharaohs religious figures and wealthy citizens but although these statues might depict different people or beings many of them share a commonality and what's that commonality broken noses broken noses now I'm actually reading this article I read elsewhere, my other's reasoning on the ancient reasons. I'm not too sure if it's going to bring it out, but just stay tuned right here, 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 right? The, this broken nose epidemic is so persuasive, it makes you wonder whether it was all the result of accidents or if something more sinister was happening. Right? This is from an article here in Live Science. Why do ancient Egyptian statues have broken nose? Now, some within like the black consciousness communities, and I heard this since the 90s, so from someone pointing to ones like Napoleon, the French, and even the British and others, right, having certain racist tendencies, which is no doubt that they did have this, you know what I mean, as they try to deny and they lied, you know, in many ways, you know, they, the way they drew pictures, though they looked at these actual things before they were photographs, we can see their, their European, their, their white, you know, their whitening, right, of many of these pictures of ancient black people. So this is clear, right? But when they allege that all of these statues that have broken noses is a result of modern mischief, we do not agree with that. We do agree that, yes, there are cases that mischief was involved, but there's also the ancient right, um, understanding that we get even reflected here in this particular biblical verse in Leviticus that is speaking to the priests and the priests only among the children of Israel. Right? So it turns out the answer is, in most cases, the latter. Right? In most cases, the latter. Something sinister was going on. These statues have broken noses because many ancient Egyptians believed that statues had a life force. They believed that the images that they created as statues had a life force. And if an opposing power came across a statue, it wanted to disable. The best way to do that was to break off the statue's nose. Now, they say here, according to Adela Oppenheim, a curator in the Department of Egyptian Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Now, this is true according to ancient understanding and ancient precepts concerning the nose. Right, concerning that broken nose. But we're going to get into the Hebrew perspective that is brought out in HaTorah, right, just after this right here. Let's just go through right here. So we're up to, it was common to perform ceremonies on statues, including the opening of the mouth ritual. What's referred to as the opening of the mouth ritual. For us as Hebrews, it's learning the basic Abu Gida, the basic Aleph Beit, the Abba Gada of the Hebrew and the Hahu He's of the Ethiopic, the vowel, the vowels, the seven, the seven tones of the Hebrew, and our basic two two. This is the beginning of the opening of the mouth of, for I and I. But in ancient Egypt, they had an opening of the mouth ritual where they would do certain performances, right, ceremonies on this side of the reality that was said to give their dead loved ones the power of speech in the afterlife. Now, in which the statue was anointed, the opening of the mouth ritual with oil. So the statue was anointed and had different objects held up to it, which were believed to enliven it. Now, it's interesting because some of the basic precepts that we know of from the ancient world, even through the testimony of ancient Egypt, that mouthpiece for Africa, in the Africa, Tobia, Ititiophia, ancient Ethiopia, and the inner roots, right? That the principles were common and understood to many different peoples, but how different peoples interpreted it or how they maintain the ancient truths and the new innovation, just like religion or like a lot of things that go on even today, right? But it's interesting that the opening of the mouth ritual, right, for the ancient Egyptians, which took place on a statue of a dead one, was something that also was performed, even what we find even within the Hebrew 
by the practices even in Ha Torah, that anointing aspect. Remember, when we're speaking about the priests, we're speaking about the only ones in the camp of Yisrael that were Christian. I say Christian for emphasis, Christian mean anointed one, Christiano, that were Meshachim, right? Meshachawiyan, that were anointed ones, that were anointed. So here they say the opening of the mouth ritual in which the statue was anointed with oils and had different objects held up to it, which were believed to enliven it, right? Understand the principles, right? This ritual... Right? gave the statue a kind of life and power, Oppenheim said. Now, the belief that statues had a life force was so widespread that it spurred antagonists to extinguish, to extinguish, let's look this up a little bit more, to extinguish that force when the need arose. For example, people taking apart repurposing, robbing, desecrating temples. And we're not talking about other people who came in after, you could say, the heyday of Mitzrayim, of Kemet was over. We're speaking about what was done even in ancient Egyptian times, what Tutmos III right, did to his sister mother, right, Hatshepsut, right, the daughter of Pharaoh. What, what he did to her, you could say, works and her remains, her legacy as well. These things happened in ancient times. Right? And other sacred sites would have likely believed that statues had life forces that could in some way harm intruders. So people would even believe right, this about hieroglyphs and other images of animals and people. This is known. Certain hieroglyphs were said to be so powerful that they were actually struck even in ancient times, like split, so that, say, a viper would not, the, the venom would not be there. So here, you basically have to kill it. You have to kill it. And one way to do that was to cut off the nose so that it couldn't breathe. You know, it was this kind of a sympathetic, as he would say, sympathetic magic, right? Now, the last part of this right here, here, here. However, sometimes adversaries didn't stop at just the nose. Some also smashed and damaged the face, arms, and legs to deactivate the life force or to cripple or make lame. Right? There are likely some instances in which statues naturally tipped over and a, a protruding nose broke as a result. Erosion from the elements such as wind and rain and also likely wore down some statues' noses. But you can usually tell if a nose was destroyed intentionally by looking at cut marks on the statue. Oppenheimer divulged. Right? This is from a How It Works. Now, they didn't mention that maybe Europeans also were involved in that, right? You know, some of the explorers, when they found out that so much, because remember that before they actually got to see the real things, that they were making themselves believe, the northern white people, so-called European, the white Europeans were making themselves believe, right, that all the ancient world was basically white. They were on this delusion, right? But let's go on. So we get statues like this, broken off, right, broken off, many of them, from ancient times. Now, we're not saying that none of this was done in modern times, but based on the evidence, based on the evidence and, and, and the reality of it, it is not as widespread, right, in the later days and times as many believe that a lot of this happened in ancient times because of those basic principles that are also testified in ancient Egypt, right? Why are noses missing? from so many Egyptian statues? Well, one of the answers that in ancient times they understood, those who understood the particular spirituality or magic or, you know, rituals that the ancient commit to you, the Mitzrayim, you know, were doing, right? Even amongst the ancient Egyptians, we know about the antagonism that Tutmos the third had for his sister Hapshepsut. And the real reason is because of the Exodus, right? Involving around the children of Israel, Moshe, and the Exodus. That's the, that's the real, real reason right there. But that this was also done in ancient times. If one dynasty came to power and ousted the next dynasty, right? They tore up their stuff, right? Because they understood in the afterlife, they were still, you know, still um, attacking and inflicting punishments on their adversaries, even their own, you could say, 
Egyptian Kemetic nationalists, you know, people who were Kemetic as well, right? Right here, here, here. Now, some of these things, right, may have occurred in, in modern times. And it's a shame that the European is not able to acknowledge. I'm sure many of them and the scholars and the universities and the museums, you know, that have their own secret stash and files, you know, and know some things they haven't revealed to the public. So we can get a fuller perspective of this. So we see where some statues, we can see that it was worn down in many different places, right? Which definitely seems, you know, to be sometimes works of past times. Now, on the manuscripts level, We've seen a lot of them doctoring manuscripts, and even with the computer technology nowadays, they are doing a lot of funny stuff to try to change the features and complexions of the ancient Egyptians to match nowadays, you know, you could say Egyptians, you know, um, who are part actually Greek and a different mixtures of people, right? So in looking at, you know, many of these different statues, you can see that sometimes noses were worn down on some of it, right? And as we mentioned, some of it had to do with ancient days, right? This one says, when Europeans saw the statues look nothing like them, they knocked the noses off and told you, you Egyptians were European and Arabic, and Arabs or Arabic. How convenient. Well, that did happen in some cases. There's no doubt about it. I mean, we can see the animus at finding out so much was black when they painted in some of these older, the older Egyptian, Egyptology books, like budges. When you look at some of budges, you see some of the paintings that they did of these things that they saw in Egypt. And then we look at the paintings and look at the actual artifact that they painted it from now that we have cameras. And you can see how they distorted the features to make it look more like themselves. Right? So that right there is very plausible and there's a lot of accuracy in that but also you have to recognize what occurred in ancient times right what occurred in ancient times and the reason the reason why why right? that it occurred in ancient times so just as in modern times in some cases yes they did disturb, dis disturb or destroy ancient artifacts because for racist reasons but then also in ancient days, ones did it because of, of enemy, you know, of, of human, we said a human condition, right? The universal human condition, all right? So right here, 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 just going on with these noses right here, you know, some of this might be construed as racist, but using this as an example right here, right? Talking about different kind of noses, right? Now, I thought this one was particularly interesting right here, right? We're talking about noses and flat noses. This one here, you notice it said a Greek, a hawk, Nubian, a Roman, right, snub, and turned up, right, turned up, right. Notice the one that says Nubian. I thought that was particularly interesting because though the, the, the drawing is still of somebody who has blue eyes and pale skin, right, there are black people who do have all sort of physiognomy, features, right, you know, features. They like to call the Ethiopians the dark-skinned Caucasian, you know what I mean? But then they confuse people with the real meaning of Caucasian. And that's a whole other vlog video study right there. But just notice how they have the Nubian nose. That's interesting. Because sometimes I've heard people say, oh, that can't be, that can't be a, a black person. Like we look at ancient Egyptian artifact. That can't be a black person, right? And it's because they see and see, but they don't want to accept what they see. Now, here, 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 right? None of these so far are really flat noses, right? Even in the sense of flat noses, right? Let's go through some of this right here. Okay, got a flat nose, no praying to God's altar for you, right? No, it wasn't saying that. It was saying serving at God's altar, right? Serving at God's altar. This is the verse right here, once again, for whatsoever man he be, now remember speaking to the priests, whatever man who is a son of Aaron, who is of the Kohanim, the priesthood that he be, right, that hath a blemish, a moon, right, any blemish, he shall not approach. In other words, he cannot approach to the altar, right? What people don't recognize is that it's the priests alone that approach to the altar, right? People, they went about the altar, but it's the priest that did that service, that did that function. That was their job. That was their service. That's what they did. 
Because remember, the sons of Israel, the rank and file Israelites, lost that because of what occurred at the go at the at the molten calf. I'm about to say golden calf at the molten calf incident. Just to clarify what what approach means. One has to understand it in the Hebrew context. It doesn't mean that, say if there was somebody that did so-called have a flat nose, even the way that people make believe, right? That one can still bring forward an offering. They could give an offering because they'll be giving it through the priests. The priests were the officiants. They were the ones who officiated the service. They was the one who actually carried out the main parts that connected with the tabernacle. People would enter the courtyard, right? They'll bring their offerings. You know what I mean? They could make sacrifices, but they would make the sacrifices to the priest. Basically, they would bring the offering, right? They would lay on hands if it was a sin offering. You know what I mean? They would um, also have to do the job in slaying the animal. The priest would catch the blood. You know what I mean? The priest would take the blood if necessary, you know, whether to the altar, the sides of the altar, and to pour it at the sides of the altar. The priest would do all of that function so if there was a man who was a priest in other words he was he was of the sons of of Aaron right that's how you that's how you could be a priest according to the Torah right the Torah of Moshe you could only be a priest if you was a son right a son of Aaron a son of Aaron if you could trace your lineage right to Aaron right and his sons Right? And therefore, it was saying from that point, ad infinitum, going forward, right, until, right, that no one who was a son of Aaron, who had the privilege of being a priest, it didn't say that one could, but he could not approach, he could not do the service at the altar, he could not go through the service. So he could be a priest in the sense that he could teach. But he could not approach to do the actual service. You know, we could put this in another context, right? It's like if somebody is serving your food, in a sense, and, and you are the, you know, you are the, the guests, and even you are the host, right? You want ones to be presentable in certain ways. I mean, this is if you want to look at this, if you want to look at this on a literal sense, just to break down all the senses of this. Right? Any blemish, let him not approach the offer, right? The bread of his God, right? And the Lord told Moses to tell Aaron, right? To tell Aaron and to speak to the sons of Aaron, or he that hath a flat nose. So, what's the real meaning here of a flat nose? Okay, right here, boom. Let me give you an example of a flat nose. In fact, I think we took a screenshot of this. I don't know whether we have it here, so you can see the fuller context of this particular meme, this particular pic right here. This is a woman who had a flat nose. That is literally, it's almost like a broken nose, had a flat nose. And that would not mean that one who was an Israelite could not offer, who could not praise God, or who could not worship, or give any offering, or enter into the courtyard. They could enter into the courtyard. They could enter, but they could not approach to the altar. But this right here is a literal sense of flat nose. I just want you to see right here. And this is not a black person with the flat nose. So black people, right, because our nose come in all different kind of phenotypes, right, and some of the black people's nose, some people may want to call flat. It's not really flat, flat. It's like the whole flat earth. It's, it's not really flat, flat, but it is a plane, right? It is an earthly plane that the globe is the heavens. The heavens is the globe, right? We're going to say this on the record right here, right? I know one's going to disagree, right? But here we have the scriptures and we have the perceivable reality. So far, NASA hasn't given us anything additional. All they give us is their mathematics, you know, Copernicus and other kind of mathematical. Nice math is is nice math, right? But something can be theoretical, right? But not actual. So when we talk about an actual flat nose, if one seeks to interpret it that way, right? And there's a level of that that can be interpreted. We're speaking of a condition, something like this right here, right? Just to hold that right there. Right? Now these two children right here,
just to notice this we caught this as well right is this a Jacob and the Esau some might say but notice that right here their nose are not flat noses their nose are not flat noses like a snub snub or even pudgy right nose but it's not a flat nose we just showed you what a flat nose is right and the doctors and ones who want to do the scientific thing science will tell you that's what a flat nose is this is a flat nose she had her nose corrected right she had her nose corrected right now right here okay so here 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 yeah this is a psalm that we was on where it mentioned within the psalm right long suffering right let us go right here let's, let's bring it out of this right here and let's go to right long suffering long suffering let's look up long suffering we'll come back to this word okay we brought out the word here is harum harum now harum is very interesting harum Right, they interpret it as flat nose, but harum. Let's do this right here. What's the word? The H twenty seven sixty three. H twenty seven sixty three. Just to give one a comparison, twenty seven sixty three. Twenty seven sixty three. Let's go to the H twenty seven sixty three. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, there we go. Now there's forty eight verses that have it here. Now, we're not going to go through all 48 verses right here. But we're going to give you a sense of what these 48 verses here, using the same, right, the same root word. He that sacrifices to any God, right, any L, right, any power, right, save except to Yahweh only, he shall be utterly destroyed, right? He shall be utterly, is it the Harum here? Let's go right here. And let's look at this right down here. Bring it up right here. Right? Zobeyach la Elohim Yahoram 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 Bilti la Yahuwah Levado. Right? So here it uses the sense of Yahoram. Yeah, remember, the other word was Huram. Huram. Yahoram shall be destroyed. One who is destroyed. Right? Right now, here is the verse that we have, but he bring it out as flat nose. And what's so very interesting is that in the verse itself, it did not even have the word nose. It did not even have the word nose. Right? Let's look at Leviticus right here. Leviticus, um, we could go about this another way. Maybe just share this, share some of the best practices. Here has call chayrem, chayrem. We see call chayrem. Right, everything that is devoted, it has it over here, Cheyrem, right? It has it twice in one verse, but it has a different sense of it right up here. Let's just go through this right here. Ya Yachrim, 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 right? But let's do this right here. This is what, because there's a particular sense of this particular word that's brought out here. Let's get this right here. And let's actually grab the the word. Let's grab it with the um, what they call it with the nikodot. With the nikodot. Let's go at the top. Let's get it from one of these versions here of the nikodot. The nikodot is the pointing. Cause we want to just do a quick, a quick, a quick search, right in the scripture, right a quick search right here in the scripture, and to see whether this shows up right whether well, this shows up right and uh, 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 let's take this off for a moment and let's go back over here let's go to aleppo not, not aleppo it will be actually i think this one right here and let's paste this in here and let's go like that so this form of the word right harum or harum or one who is destroyed, one who is devoted, like set apart, like they have like a secluded, like a like a like a, a, a harem. People say harem, harem. That same word, the harem, like put aside, one who is put aside or whatnot. In that sense, right there, there, there. But now, bringing that out right there, let's let's return to this right here. Just wanted to check that out. 
right there and see see how many times the word in this form, this kind of like paul, almost like a paul, right, form the harum, right? How many times it is actually found in the scripture, and this is the only place. Now remember what we began off connecting about the life force, right? About the life force, ancient Egypt, and the real reasons why, you know. They destroyed, you know, statues and the noses of statues, right? Because of their understanding. See, we're looking at it today because of counterfeit Christianity, white supremacy, you know, all the lies and everything, and trying to find, you know, trying to find what the truth of the matter is, right? But now we have to recognize that there's also the ancient truth, right? So flat nose appears there. Now we're going to look up long suffering. Let's look up long suffering. People say, well, why, 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 why are we going to long suffering? Why are we going to long suffering right here? Because it's important now to understand the Hebrew context. Right? Let's go long suffer. Boom. Now, here we're in Exodus. There's 23 verses long suffering. And so here is where we get the 13 attributes of Yahweh Hey, of He who be who ye be, Hakadosh Baruchu Baruch Hashem. And Yahweh Hey passed by. Before him and proclaim Yahuwah, Yahuwah, El Rahun. Right? So here we have Rahun, where Hanun, and Hanun, Hanun, right? And gracious. Now, here you see long suffering has two words, right? It's Erek, right? Erek, Erek means long, right? Now, Erek has two senses. There's the two truths of the Hebrew. There's a natural sense, like it's long, like the pinions being long, but also long in the patient sense, slow to anger, right? Slow to anger. So right here we have, right, erek, long, right? It could be long-winged, but it also can apply in the same sense of length to long-suffering. The idea of the erek or arek, arekapai, right, is literally is long-nosed, long nose. Right, slow to anger. Right, so the idea of erek apayim. So we have erek there, and then we have up or af. Right, but in this pointing afayim, you can see it's the nostril, the af, the nostril, the nose, the face. But also af, Hebraically, in the second of the two truths. Right, Hebrew has its two truths. Hebrew has a, a built-in like metaphysical. The Afro-Semitic, Shemitic languages has this built-in metaphysical level where the words have like a twofold sense at least a twofold sense it has like a natural earthly type and then it also has like a heavenly type it has a you could say a, a, a natural type right and like a meta a metaphysical type an esoteric type so in the natural sense of af right sometime pointed as up it's the word for nostril nose or even in a sense for face because one's nose is usually in the middle of their face. It's, it's the most prominent part often of one's face. But then the nose, the af, can also mean anger, right? So it's a noun masculine, right? So properly the word af is nose or nostril. I want you to, just to get this as we go through this right here. Just the basics. Nose or nostril. So nose in the general sense, af. But then we have afayim or apayim. It's like the nostrils, the two nostrils. But hence, this meaning of it as a face. It's not literally the word for face, but in its use, bringing out the, the learned Hebrew sense, right? To a Hebrew speaker or reader that understood the biblical Hebrew sense, it could also refer to face. Occasionally, right? In an occasional sense, to a person. Right? And also, you see where it says also from the rapid breathing and passion. So the Hebrew sense of the word nose can also refer to rapid breathing and passion. I don't know if many ones and ones understand there's a kind of a science of like, like anger management. Doesn't mean you're going to be able to control it, control it, but managing anger is checking your breath. Most people, when they get caught up in anger, feeling emotion, they don't even notice that their breath becomes short because of the rapidity, the rapidness of breathing. If one could become conscious in situations of their breathing, 
even while they feel themselves getting angry and focus on their breath and their breathing and breathe rhythmically and slow, right? They can actually gain mastery over some of the baser, you know, baser emotions like quick temper, right? The quick temper. So from rapid breathing in passion, like ire, is that iry or ire? Ire, I-R-E, right? Anger, angry, right? So this is one of the senses of this second word. So the word here, we're just touching on a few of what's called the 13 attributes, right? Of he who be who he be. Because Yahweh, hey, Yahweh, Yah, Yahweh, in the third person sense of the Ehya Asher, Ehya, mean he be, he becomes who he be, who he becomes. Yah, he who be. Ehya, I become, right, from the higher sense, right? So who he be. So here to Moshe in Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, right? Yahweh. Right, pass by before him. Right, he passed by. He abar, abar. That's at the root of Hebrew. He passed by before him and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, El, Rachum, Wechanun, Erekapayim. He declared. Think about this for a moment. It says that he who be who he be, Jehovah, passed by before him and proclaimed. He proclaimed his own name. Right. He proclaimed Yahweh, hey, Yahweh, right? Yahweh. He proclaimed his own name twice. It's interesting in this particular verse that here we have the true Trinity, the Hebrew Trinity. When the rabbis, the Rebani, knew of the true Hebrew Trinity, right here we have three times in one verse Yahweh, hey, and Jehovah passed by before him and proclaimed Jehovah, Jehovah, El, El, El. Chayil, Chayil in the archaic, you could say Shemitic, Chayil, right, like Chayla, but contracted El, El, the Almighty. Rachum, Rachum, merciful. Wechanun, Chanun and gracious. Now the word that's highlighted long suffering in the Hebrew is Erekapayim. Erekapayim. Notice right here, even in Numbers, in Numbers 14 and 18, we find the same two words, Erekapayim. Notice over here in Psalm 86, we also have these two same words, Erekapayim. But thou, Adonai, right, art a El, right, a El, El, right, full of compassion, gracious, right, full of compassion, Rachum. Remember the other one said merciful, Rachum. Has to do the rechem. Rechem is like the womb, the yielding, right? Gracious, chanun, chanun. And it says long suffering, arekapayi, right? Arekapayi. So we continue to see this, right? We continue to see this in a few places. Af, erek, arekapayi. So now let's go a little bit deeper into this right here, here, here from the first instance. So here, Jehovah is explaining who he be, right, through the revelation of these 13, we call them midot, right, aspects, or one might say attributes, so to speak, in the English, but who he be, he, he who be who he be, right, he be, he who be who he be. This is why Jehovah declared Jehovah, El, El, he is the power, he's the source, right, the Almighty, he is merciful, Rachum. With and Chanun and gracious, right? And here, right, to this attribute, long suffering. Let's bring up the Hebrew, long suffering. Let's scroll down here to the Tanakh, right? Use this as one of the points of reference. Here it says, Waya Ebor, Waya Ebor Yahuwah Ala Panayo, Waya Yikra Yahuwah Yahuwah El Rahum with. Chanun, Ereka Pai, We Rab Chesed, We Amet. That's the full of full of the verse. Waya Ebor, Waya Ebor, Waya Ebor. And he passed, he passed by. Right? Abar, like, like Ibri, like Hebrew. He passed over, he transcended. Almost like he crossed over, so to speak. Waya Ebor, Yahuwah. 
he who be who he be, al panayo. Modern Hebrew does say al panav, modern Hebrew al panav, but in ancient pointing al panayo, before panai, panai, his face. Wayikra, wayikra, and he recited or he called out, wayikra, and he called out, he recited. Wayikra, interesting, wayikra, that, that would be actually the third book in the Hebrew, Wayikra, Vayikra, and he called. Wayikra, Yahuwah, and he called, he who be who he be, Yahuwah. So he calls, so Jehovah calls on his own name twice, the Father, the Son, right? Speaking in the Holy Spirit, El, 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 the Almighty, Rahum, we Hanun, and here is the part, Erek Apayim. Now, literally in Hebrew, Erek Apayim, Erek Apayim, Erek Apayim. Erek Apayim means long nose. Literally in the Hebrew, Erek Apayim means long nose. Right? But it's brought out, you see how the translator right here translates and brings out the sense of it. And literally, right? If we just literally look at it, it means long nose. Now, let's imagine this particular verse right here, if it was to be, you know, read in that sense right there, right? And Jehovah passed by before him and proclaimed, Jehovah, Jehovah, El, merciful, gracious, long-nosed, and abundant in goodness and truth. Suppose that was brought out right there. Long-nosed, long-nosed, right? But they bring out, Correctly here, the sense of erek apayim, right? Erek, long, patient, right? Long, patient, because that principle of even anger management, when, when you get and we get and when people get angry, they often unconscious of their breathing. If you maintain conscious of your breathing and you get angry or even afraid, you'll notice that your breath will change, your breathing will change. All you need to do is consciously regulate your breathing and you'll find that your feelings, your emotions, your nerves, right? It helps to regulate that because that's the connection with the soul when we start to look at the principles of science, the Hebrew science of it. So, erekapayim means long suffering, means long nose because instead of just getting angry and just popping off, right? One, take a breath. Like you tell one, just take a breath, just take a breath, just breathe, take a breather. You know, we've been in situations, maybe we've been the person in the situation or somebody else. We try to minister them down from, you know, they might even faint. Sometimes people just faint. They get so heated so quickly, right? They just pass out because their breathing becomes very rapid. Once again, let's go to the word erek. Erek again, right? See the two, the twofold truths of the Hebrew? On one level means long, right? Long. Remember the twofold word. Erek, erek, long, apayim, apayim, like nose or nostrils. Long nose, long nostrils. The secondary is patient. One being patient. And the idea, the Hebraic idea that's brought out even in the scripture testimony and witness in the Hebrew is slow to anger. Slow to anger. Now the word erek is an adjective in the Hebrew. So erek, it could be like long-winded, right? It could be long-winded, like winged, long-winged, or it could be long-suffering. So both we have it in the literal sense, like a bird having long wings, kapayim, erek, kapayim, you know what I mean? Kapayim, you know, or it can have one being long-suffering as he who be who he be, patient. Right? Because let's go to the root right here. So we have Arak. Arak is to be long, to prolong. Right? To prolong. Right? To lengthen. To lengthen your breath. So that's the key of anger management. You know, if you can recognize your breath in certain given situations, even fear, many times, can be regulated by breathing. Right? It's amazing, the breath and the breath of life and the nefesh, the soul, the psyche, that whole Hebrew science there, right? It's both metaphysical science, but it's also real world science if we understand the basic principles. So what we have in this particular verse right here, 
Let's just show the word, the twofold word right there. There we go, right there. Erek, reading from right to left. Apayim, right? Erek apayim. And we already brought out right here the sense of Erek, right? The Erek right here, right? Has to do with slow, right? Patient, right? Slow to anger, right? To be long in the sense of being patient. Apayi, af, right? The af is the nostril the nose, the face. And then the secondary is anger, right? The nose, because the connection of the nose and breathing and anger and emotions is very clear. The problem is that most of us are not conscious of our breathing at those times. If we maintain conscious of our breathing and breath, right, and have developed a discipline in breathing, we can regulate our breathing and breath and also it helps to regulate our thoughts as well. Right? The secondary level of af or ap in one pointing or af, the nostril, the nose, the face is anger. Anger. Right? And notice what we showed from earlier. Strong's definition from the H599. Properly, the word af means the nose or nostrils in the sense of afayim or the pointing of apayim, the nostrils, long nose, long nostril. That means patience long suffering a flat nose or a short nose means one who is impatient bringing out the metaphysical aspect of that not even literally right in a sense of long like we said it's blind one who's blind right we talk about jacob Yaakov being legally blind right that even though he loved esau right the promise was really to Yaakov. Right? He recognized that later on, after his wife, he is Eshet, Oset, you know, put him up on what was going on, right? So we can see even a woman, you know, he says, what you know, a woman, you might save your man, save your husband, right? Or what you know, a man, you might save your wife, right? So in the real sense of the Bible, we have that truth. But in these counterfeit interpretations, you know, like flat nose, they could have said one who is quick-tempered, right? They could have brought that out as quick-tempered since that is the 180-degree opposite of this attribute. Remember that Jehovah Hila him created man in his image after his likeness. For man, he had other choices, right? He made other choices. Therefore, we're in this consequence of, of, of positives and negatives or this, this kind of psycho-spiritual physics, right? Ever since the Gan Ba'edin the so-called Garden of Eden, in that sense, right? But in the beginning, he was created in the image and after the likeness. That means that as his creator, the blameless creator, is long-suffering. That's what it says, be perfect. You remember what Robeno Yeshua HaMoshiach teaches? Be perfect as your father, right? As our father who is perfect. It's not speaking about the outer aspects, but the inner aspects, the aspects of heart and mind. So we have anaf, right? Anaf right here, right? So we have anaf in the Hebrew. Anaf is to be angry, right? So we have the af, the anaf. So these connections to be angry, right? To be angry, right? To be angry. But notice when we get the Strong's definition. The anaf brings it to the primitive root, right? The ancient, we say Afro Semitic, the ancient Shemitic root, right? To breathe hard, to breathe hard. How many times you tell an angry person, or you, the angry person, being told, just take a breath, take a breath, just, just breathe, just breathe, just breathe. That is to be enraged, to be enraged, to be angry, or to even be displeased. Sometimes if you check your breath, if you think about different things and you're conscious of your breathing, you'll see your breathing change. All right? So that is a, you know, that's a, that's a key right there. That's a key right there, but that was brought out by studying the scriptures, right? And see, even in the scriptures, you'll see the connection of breath, of breath, right? Of breath. I mean, even Yahweh Hay speaks about his, uh, his uh, nefesh, and the nefesh, the soul, the psyche is always she, right? In the scripture, in the science of the scripture. So that's also another very important point. So here, here, here on the long nose, Right, the long nose, the flat nose. So what we have in this particular verse in the scripts, let's go over here. This was on another 
related reasoning. What we have right here in the scripts, right here, is a twofold truth, right? First of all, it wasn't speaking to all the Israelites. And it wasn't saying to the Israelites that if, if you have a flat nose, well, we already showed you what flat nose is, right? We, show, we even show you different noses, right? right? This is the verse right here, right? For whatsoever man he be, speaking to the sons of Aaron, who in the same chapter, go to the top of the chapter, the first verse of chapter 21, right? To speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron. So this is strictly for the priests, right? That hath a blemish, right? He shall not approach that has a blemish. A blind man or a lame. So we can use the word blind in the literal sense. I mean, if he's blind, then how we know where the altar is? How do you know whether that's really kosher? You know, certain things you would have to be able to perceive by sight. This is why Robain or Yeshua, he was healing the blind, right? Those who were physically blind, right? As well as those who were psycho-spiritually blind or lame, right? A lot of Christians, those called of Christians are lame. I right, talk all this Christ talk and all these wonderful platitudes, but they don't really live it up or live it out. Some might say the same thing about many of I and I. But that's a point there because I and I's Rastafari says like to live it, like to learn it. You got to learn it up and then we have to walk it out, try it out, live it out. But if one can't live it out, another way of saying is like they are lame. Or he that half a flat nose, we showed you, is the word... Um, um, the what is it? Khuram, 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 the Khuram, right? The Khuram, right? There's a couple of names that begin like that. We're gonna do a little more research on this as well. But Khuram was one who's secluded, one who's devoted, and the idea of the word from Haram is secluded, or something that's devoted to extermination or destruction. And we can see this both in the opposite of long nose which is an attribute of long-suffering. Literally, the Hebrew is saying long nose. But the meaning of it doesn't mean that your physical nose is long, right? But one has patience. One takes that breath, takes the spirit, right? The spirit, spirit, God send the spirit, take a breath, right? And we take a breath even when you're getting a little bit heated, right? Because your breathing becomes irregularly, right? You can think it through clearer and you recognize that if you didn't think it through, you might do something that is, you know, that is devoted for destruction. So you see the connection of the flat nose from the Hebrew, the, the Huram, right? From Haram, something that's secluded like a harem, a, 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 a harem. They say, they say harem today, right? Harem, right? But it's something that is devoted to be destroyed, right? So that is set apart to be destroyed, right? Or that which is set apart that if it is encountered, right, would be destroyed. And somebody who is quick-tempered, it should say, or he that hath a quick temper, or anything superfluous, like extra. John say this and this and this, and then they want to add that and that and that. But let's keep to what John says, right? Nothing more nothing less let's get the context let's understand his thoughts right which are higher than our thoughts so a blind man a lame or he that half a flat nose now we showed you already the flat nose too right and even when we looked it up we didn't find no black person with a flat nose in fact even when we went over some of the pics for nose let's see if we show you this right here again you'll see that the one that did, look at the nubian nose the Nubian nose looks kind of straight and pointy, but you know what? In really looking at black people and different black people's noses and everything, we recognize that the stereotype was a lie. Like counterfeit Christianity is a lie. Whitewash, Anglo-Saxon price is a lie. Look at the one with the snub nose. The snub nose, right? Some, some black folks have more noses like that than anything else, right? Some of them, but that's not even a flat nose. We showed you once again, let's just show this once again before we get out of here, the flat nose, right? The flat nose. This right here, right, is clinically called a flat nose. And this woman here, right, appears to be a white woman, right? She got her nose repaired because her nose was... Now, even if she wanted to worship, 
right? And she was an Israelite. Just say, just say, just say if she was an Israelite, she could worship, but she could not approach the altar to do the service. She could bring forth whatever her gift, her offering, right? Proclaim what it's for, give it to the priest. The priest goes on and does it on her behalf. That was what we try to explain at the very beginning so one can understand the context. It wasn't saying all people. It wasn't saying you can't pray to God if you have a so-called flat nose or whatever. First of all, we explained that the flat nose, right? We go back to ancient Egypt, right? And think about it, the anger. Anger, right? is usually manifest physiologically by changes in breath and in breathing. Did you know that? Anger, right? Like you said, that a lion, like a lion, the anbesa, the arie, right? The ari, right? The arie smells for fear, right? He smells for fear. Most, most predatory animals, they can smell for fear. But what I perceive is that they smell or they can perceive because they're hearing cats, you know, they can perceive that fear. They can perceive the difference in breathing, right? The distress in breathing, right? I remember one time I was on a block trying to get some ancients and police had to run down on this block. And some of the homies I knew over there, you know, got pushed up against, you know, the fence and everything. I remember one cop went up to, I was just walking through the block, you know, Rastaman just passing through. You know, I had some books with me and everything. So they think, oh, this, this nerdy Rastafari, right? So I just passed through. I remember passing by one of them and the police, the white boy police he he had on this kind of like the lumberjack some of you remember back in the 90s the lumberjack like the television repairman refrigerator repairman right driving around those unmarked cars but one of the guys that jumped out this car put his hand on the chest of this black young black man right and he says says something about like why are you breathing like that you scared what you know in other words in the same sense perceived and sought out his breath you know what i mean sought out his breath in the sense of the fear right and if one learns to with breathing techniques to regulate their breathing and become conscious of their breathing since remember in the very beginning it's about he breathed into man right the breath of life right and man became a living soul so people talk about spirituality but they never make the connection of breath and the real use of breathing recognizing our breathing under different psychological soul states of mind. So what we shared from the beginning, what happened in ancient Egypt and other ancient civilization, where sometimes they would break off the nose because of their religious, spiritual, you know, ideology that one statue, right, on this side had an effect of the people on the other side. So to break off their nostril, then that person could not breathe. And think about this with quick, quick tempered, quick breath, quick tempered. You would not be suitable, right, to do the offerings as intermediaries between Haile Him, the power, Hakadosh Baruch Baruch Hashem, and His people, right? So that right there, that because that would be superfluous. That'll be something extra. This life science article right there points to it a little bit more right there. So flat nose, in the true sense of the scripture, right, had to do with a twofold sense. One, like one, if the nose is broken, for example, the nose flat or broken as we show, right? Some sort of a defect because we know that noses are not like that. We see ancient Egypt, we see black people's nose, and black people's nose are only stereotypically in racist propaganda cartoons. Like say, all black people got the same nose. No, that's that's a lie right there. In ancient Egypt, they will break off the nose to stop the life. So I submit to you that the same principles are at, at effect here in what the Torah is speaking of, but getting a little bit deeper than that, right? We're getting to the quick tempered aspect, that flat nose, they say a short nose, a flat nose, easy, easily angered. In other words, you blind, you lame, and you get angry too quick. You blind and you lame and you get angry too quick. Therefore, you can't do the service of Yahuwah, of Jehovah in the holy place. You can't be a, a suitable intermediary, right, 
between Ja and Ja people. So here, here, here. Shalom Habarim. Shalom. Check out the description. Any links, also the podcast, the replay, right? Check out the podcast. If it's too late when we go live, you can check out the replay the next day. Um, like, share, subscribe. Give thanks, brothers and sisters, to support this ministry of His Majesty, the Lion of Judah Society. Give thanks and praise. Yes, I. Shalom Habarim. Shalom.